Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session at CCUS 2021, Leading on Net Zero and Clean Growth. Um, I'm delighted as chair to be joined by an illustrious panel today um, and to have a keynote speech which is coming up from Sir Ian Wood. Um, just by way of introduction to me as chair, I'm Emma Pinchbeck, I'm the Chief Executive of Energy UK, the trade body for the energy industry a whole, as a whole. And in that regard, we see you know, carbon capture is absolutely critical to delivering a decarbonised power system, but also the wider decarbonisation of the UK economy and, and building off the success of many of the technologies that we'll have here in country. Um, in, I Just on a personal note, I've worked on carbon capture in all of my job roles. This is in the energy sector and in the environmental movement. And the reason to remain interested in sequestration is quite simply that we need it. We know that in order to achieve 1.5 degrees, according to the IPCC, the international body of scientists that advise the UN negotiations, and indeed to achieve the UK's own net zero target, we need a mixture of man-made and natural sequestration. And in particular, CCUS is, is in some ways the only game in town. We also know that we're going to need a significant amount of abated gas and, and baseload on our very flexible, diverse, interesting uh, future power system. And so with both my environmentalist hat on and my energy systems hat on, I'm fascinated to see if we can repl replicate the success we've had with building up offshore wind and other innovative technologies here in the UK. Um, so that's, that's my piece. Um, a reminder for everyone watching that delegates can put their questions for panelists into the Hoover chat and I will pick them up as chair and try to get through as many of them as possible. The format of this session is that we'll have a, a keynote from Sir Ian Wood and then we'll have some responses from our other panellists and then a debate where we will take your questions. Um, and so with that, with no further ado, as I can see that he's ready, I'd like to introduce Sir Ian Wood, who's the chair of ETZ Limited, to give us our keynote address. Thank you, Emma, um, and good morning, everyone. I think I want to say, first of all, if we are to be successful in making energy sufficient real, there are two essentials. And um, firstly, we will need government support and where necessary intervention to create the infrastructure and environment to achieve effective and accelerated energy transition. And secondly, and probably more important, we will absolutely need inter-industry collaboration, working closely with government and with other industry partners. I believe we're on the cusp of transformational change in energy, the scale of which is immense, and I'm encouraged by the progress being made, but there's still so much to do as we strive to make the transition real. So, what are the essential actions? Maybe surprisingly, and but firstly and very importantly, we must support the UK's oil and gas industry as an essential contributor to energy transition. There's a naive belief in some quarters that we can simply turn off the oil and gas industry and renewables will instant, instantaneously take up the slack. I mean, we all know that just simply isn't the case. Low carbon resources and technologies aren't yet available at scale. And the Committee on Climate Change believe we'll be doing well if we achieve 75% of renewable energy self-sufficiency by 2050. The 50 years experience building up a world-class oil and gas industry, has involved employment and infrastructure, finance and know-how, will help us develop our green energy industry to be world-class. The key objective in tackling the climate emergency is to over achieve overall net carbon zero by 2045 in Scotland, 2050 in England. I don't know any why the difference, but they are. Um, but to do that, we must focus right now on a major drive in the new energy industries. And that's accelerating a huge potential in our offshore wind resources, conversion of natural gas to hydrogen, and carbon capture and storage, and we can do it. The reality is that cutting back on our oil and gas production prematurely will simply result in increasing imports, which will have a higher carbon content than ours, because we're doing everything we can to cut back on carbon emissions. So we would be worse off in terms of climate change with a huge loss of jobs and real damage to our balance of payments. Therefore, the focus must be on how quickly we achieve net zero not on how quickly we stop oil and gas. Secondly, there are a lot of opportunities in energy transition to go for, and just one example. During his budget statement in March, the Chancellor put the northeast of Scotland front and centre of green recovery investment 
by announcing £27 million towards the development of the energy transition zone in Aberdeen, which matches the Scottish Government's support some months earlier through its energy transition fund. I'm privileged to chair ETZ, which will play a pivotal role in establishing the North East of Scotland as a global leader in energy transition, and in time, a net exporter of products, services, technologies and skills. Just as an example of the kind of work we're going to be doing, it'll leverage Aberdeen Harbour Board's £350 million investment in a, in a second harbour, the South Harbour, um, with a unique offering of combined marine and onshore support with non-tidal deep water facilities. Key activities to be developed within the ETZ are likely to include high value manufacturing, marshalling and assembly for offshore wind, a floating offshore wind centre of excellence, offshore hydrogen production landing facilities, green hydrogen test and demonstration facilities and high value manufacturing for hydrogen, low carbon marine fuel tests and demonstration facilities, business incubation and scale up, and an energy uh, skills hub. Discussions are already underway to engage both domestic and international investors in the zone, and each of you must work hard to identify the good opportunities for you. Thirdly, we're witnessing firsthand a range of exciting development that'll help make Scotland and the UK a global leader in the development of floating offshore wind. Northeast of Scotland is home to about a quarter of Europe's offshore wind resources, with a number of pioneering projects, including Equinor's High Wind Scotland, the largest floating wind project operating today, to be followed by Kincardine, which is still on track for completion this year, and then Vattenfall's European Offshore Wind Deployment um, Centre. There's huge potential to be realised from Scotwind, the world's first fully commercial offshore wind leasing round, which is something who may wish to speak to in more detail, given the Crown Estate is involved. The majority of the Scotwind licences are within a 100 mile radius of Aberdeen and will add up to 11 gigawatts um, from offshore wind to the UK in the next 10 to 15 years, with investment expected to surpass £8 billion. Many of these sites are in deeper water, best suited to floating wind, which is still pre-commercial and needs to achieve significant scale and cost reduction to be competitive, but it will succeed. Fourthly, and obviously of particular interest to this uh, gathering today, we must accelerate the development of carbon capture and storage. The Committee on Climate Change has stated that CCS is a necessity, not an option, to achieve net zero by 2050 in UK and 2045 in Scotland. I wholeheartedly agree. The reality is we are not moving fast enough and we must step up the pace significantly. CCS projects have been operating successfully across the world since the mid 1990s. As at the end of 2020, there were 26 commercial CCS facilities operating globally. A further three are under construction and 13 are in advanced development, um, reaching front end engineering design stage. The CCS facilities currently in operation across the world can capture and permanently store around 40 million tonnes of CO2 every year. Now that's equivalent to four times the UK's target of 10 million uh, tonnes per annum by 2030. CCS is not even new to the North Sea. On the Norwegian continental shelf, Equinor have been operating CCS projects since 1996 and have safely stored over 20 million tonnes of CO2 into offshore deep saline uh, formations in the Sleipner and Snowbit CO2 storage projects. Indeed, the Sleipner project is the longest ongoing CO2 storage project in the world. Similar suitable geology, highly porous and permeable sandstone with stable rock chemistry exists in the UK continental shelf for the safe long-term storage of CO2, which is why CCS is such an important energy transition opportunity for the UK. As we know, the UK government intends to invest a billion pounds in two carbon storage projects as part of a competition designed to ensure we meet net zero targets. There are a number of competing high quality projects and locations vying to be approved in track one and a decision is expected imminently. I frankly find this more than a little disappointing. I mean, if we are serious about decarbonisation, there's a strong case for five or six clusters to be tackled now to encourage collaboration across the UK to meet the net zero challenge. A billion pounds is not a lot of money um, and really modest in the context of the scale of the challenge we face. Also, it must be realised up front that after the licences have been awarded, 
competition should cease to be repeat, replaced by collaboration. For example, in wind farms, particularly with floating wind out in deep water, there'll be a lot of learning which must be shared among the developers. The learning could be technology development, environmental protection experience, and optimum maintenance techniques. Exactly the same will apply for carbon capture projects. There will be significant learning experience and these should be shared. In fact, honestly, there's a case to make this a condition of the license. In the one billion pound competition, <clears throat> it won't surprise you to hear that I'm endorsing the, back, the Scottish cluster campaign. It has a clear roadmap ready access to key infrastructure and a series of advanced carbon dioxide reduction projects. The crucial component of the bid is the ACON CO2 transport and storage infrastructure project, an ambitious program based on the St. Fergus gas terminal in the northeast of Scotland. It's designed to tackle climate change by dealing with both power and industrial CO2 emissions, together with those from other hard to decarbonize sectors through the manufacture of hydrogen and direct air capture. By making the existing oil and gas, by using the, uh, the oil and gas pipelines and the existing uh, huge aquifers already in, this, in place, ACON is well placed for the next phase of the UK's journey to net zero. Just some figures, 23.8 gigatons, which is 30% of the UK's total storage resources of 78 gigatons, is within a 50 kilometer radius of existing pipelines proposed for the ACON project. The 78 gigatons equate to about 200 years of storage capacity based on UK emission rates from 2019. Bayes estimates that CO2 imports from overseas could be worth 14 billion by 2050. There's an estimated three megatons per annum of domestic CO2 shipping expected by 2030. And CO2 from ship imports of Peterhead port ultimately expected to exceed nine megatons per annum. Alongside the main project, direct air capture will be introduced. And the intention is that this will become the largest um, direct air capture facility in Europe. The ACON project deals with both power and industrial CO2 emissions, together with those from other hard to decarbonize sectors through the manufacture of hydrogen and direct air capture. The gas pipelines are already in place and our offshore ge uh, geology knowledge and experience are ideal for permanently storing CO2, particularly and a region embracing hydrogen as a fuel for the future. Recent evidence of this is INEOS announcing last month they will convert its vast Scottish petrochemical plant and oil refinery at Grangemouth to run on hydrogen at a cost of more than a billion pounds to make it net zero for carbon emissions by 2045 using CCS technology and, and the aquifers. And of course, our skilled and gas workforce and supply chain has this expertise to safely deliver these complex projects designed to receive early CO2 imports from other parts of the UK, which don't have access to storage sites and eventually, eventually from overseas. It's anticipated this construction phase will support an average 7,000 jobs and by the year 2050, an average of 15,000 jobs across the UK. So just some quick thoughts in closing. I am genuinely enthusiastic about the future for our energy transition industry and the big role CCS has to play on our journey to decarbonization. To realize this opportunity fully, we need government and industry working together to deliver targeted support for the acceleration of CCS and encourage collaboration with the other energy activities I've highlighted today. In the Northeast of Scotland, we're not new to transformation. In terms of energy, we are one of the most exciting and attractive locations in Europe to develop and accelerate the commercialization of innovative low carbon technologies, having had 50, initially hard and tough years in the oil and gas industry. We've now got a lot of exciting energy transition activity underway across the UK. Along with this, we must retain our strong international and outward looking approach um, to, to build on our existing export activities, support international energy transition projects and drive sustainable growth. This is an exciting time for our industry and I'm sure the idea shared at this important conference will be invaluable as we work to make the transition real. Thank you. Very much, and yeah, fascinating insight into the transition of the North Sea Basin and, and indeed how we make sure we maximise the skills and value of the people that we've got in Scotland who've driven the previous energy, um, energy revolution in this country. So 
Um, on the note of collaboration, um, sorry, and I'm going to hand over for the first response to um, uh, bleh, engage brain to Hugh Denroygen, who I know from my previous role working in, in offshore wind. Um, and Hugh, you're going to talk a little bit about exactly this, about you know, the challenges of making sure we coordinate development in an increasingly crowded seabed and how we make sure all these technologies work together. And I think a little bit about the urgency of the transition. So Hugh, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Emma, for the introduction. And uh, really good uh, to hear you um, so clearly, sorry, Ian. And uh, what I would say, um, I would make uh, three quick points um, responding uh, to your um, address. I think the first one is completely echoing your call for urgency. We are facing a crisis and um, uh, that requires that we act with urgency and, and, and priority. And one of the questions in my mind is when these technologies have been existing for such a long time, um, why is it, uh, are we still discussing them rather than implementing them? So that sense of urgency, um, uh, uh, it, is, it is really uh, well understood. Um, I should also say maybe um, uh, as the Crown Estate, for those of you who are less familiar with us as an organization, we're entrusted with the management of the seabed around England, Wales and Northern Ireland with a sister organization, uh, Crown of State Scotland, responding to Scottish ministers. What we do is very much uh, looking at providing access to the seabed, to the, to the private sector, to enable uh, solutions to the big challenges of our time. And uh, the uh, climate crisis and the ecological crisis are surely the two biggest challenges that we have. And what we see is that the marine space is in ever greater demand uh, and there is an unprecedented call for access to seabed from a whole range of technology sectors. It is not only the CO2 storage sector, but also offshore winds. And uh, people may not realize this, but we're installing more broadband cables these days than ever before, because telecommunications is, as an industry, globalizing um, and also requires safe routes to install it cables. And I haven't even mentioned the need for marine aggregates that are so important for the construction material that we use across the country. So many, many different demands placed on the seabed, all of that needing to uh, coexist. And the point uh, here is that we will not have the luxury to say, this is a piece of seabed for CO2 storage, that's a piece of seabed for, for an offshore wind farm, that's a bit of seabed for a power cable we will need to work in that collaborative mindset that Sir Ian spoke to, and we need to be co-designing. Industries need to be working across to say, how can we design wind farms that can co-locate with CO2 storage reservoirs? What monitoring methodologies can be applied? What uh, wind farm designs, layouts need to be made such that we can use um, seabed which is a finite uh, resource, they've stopped making it, as Mark Twain uh, would have said, how can we use that seabed for multi-purpose? And that requires um, challenging our risk envelopes, challenging design assumptions, and certainly challenging our cultures where we believe that uh, we can do it all on our own. Um, and for those of you uh, who've been paying attention, you'll notice that I haven't even mentioned fisheries and of course, sustainable food production from the seas continues to be uh, a critical element as well. So all of those technologies need to collaborate. Um, and then I think the, um, uh, um, and that point on collaboration, that is very much that final third point. In the Crown Estate, uh, we have been working with the CO2 Storage Association, Oil and Gas Association, and uh, several others to create the offshore wind and CO2 co-location forum, which is creating an agenda, a technology agenda to address these co-location challenges. And if you're interested in more information, there is on the Crown Estate website, there is a report uh, from Project Vulcan that looked at these engineering challenges and where you will be able to also 
see what we're doing um, uh, uh, in this space. Um, it all relies on data and evidence. And as an organization, we're also investing in making sure that we understand where those key resource areas for CO2 storage, for wind power generation, for cable routes, uh, for marine aggregates, et cetera, where they are. So the digitization of this space is an increasingly important theme as well. And as Crown Estate, we're investing heavily in it. And with that, I will give back to you, Emma, and go on mute. Uh, by the way, I realise I didn't properly introduce you, which is a damning indictment both of how busy it is in the energy sector and the fact that we know each other and he's very well known in the industry for his work at the Crown Estate. Um, just on just on an aside, I really like the name Project Vulcan. I think, if anything, the sector is at least very good at naming our projects. Um, so, <laughs> Um, and with that, I'll hand over to our next response, which comes from um, Mike Lockett, who's the UK Country Chairman and Chief Commercial Officer for Power of Uniper. And fascinated to hear what you think um, from the perspective of your business, Mike. Thanks, Emma. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, first, just a, a little bit about Uniper. We are um, one of the large power generators in Europe and also one of the biggest importers and suppliers of, of natural gas. Um, we're also a pioneer, a pioneer in the use of hydrogen. So for the past seven years, we've been producing hydrogen from renewable power sources and blending that into the German gas grid on a, on a megawatt scale. Um, and for, for us and from our perspective, we, we see power and the power sector playing an absolutely key role in decarbonisation. It's, it's made great strides over the last two decades. But if we're going to go that next step, uh, and for example, meeting the UK government's ambitions of a predominantly decarbonised power sector by 2035, then we see CCUS as playing an absolutely key role in, in this going forward. CCUS for power generation, but also for industry, uh, and also importantly for the production of blue hydrogen. Um, this is going to be absolutely key to get the scale we need to tackle the problem. The problem is so huge, and we've got a, a major challenge ahead of us, and very much echoing what Sir Ian said, we need to increase the pace and the scale very rapidly. Um, there's encouraging signs, and the UK certainly has got some really good proposals in terms of business models and structures to do that. We as Uniper are involved in numerous projects around the world, but predominantly in Europe. We see a range of, uh, of approaches of business models being put forward. What we like about the UK approach is um, the collaboration in terms of working together in clusters to get industry and generators and producers and transport and storage organizations working with government together. But also we like the approach of having uh, business models and policy and frameworks that help us to de-risk projects so that we can attract private finance and, and private investment. Because, and, and as Emma mentioned earlier, as we've seen in the offshore wind example, if we get uh, investment at scale, competition between projects, competition between technologies, then we start to drive down the overall cost of those decarbonisation technologies. And this is also important from our perspective as, as well. You know, we, we must not be driving and developing initiatives and projects that will force and push industry offshore and simply offshore, uh, offshoring our, our, our carbon emissions. Um, just as an example on speed, you know, we've got a current uh, ambition of one, as a government, one power CCS project by 2030. And then if we're going to decarbonize the power sector by 2035, that would need a massive acceleration of investment between 2030 and 2035. From, from our perspective, we need to see things moving much more quickly and much faster, certainly in, in the power sector on, on CCS. I think the second uh, P I would mention is around being pragmatic, and that's also a very positive approach that we see from, uh, from government. Um, again, with our European perspective, we see green hydrogen being promoted in many countries, whereas we are very happy that the UK is taking the pragmatic twin track approach to both blue hydrogen and CCUS, as well as green hydrogen in our decarbonisation ambitions. This again is really key from our perspective. When we look back from 2050, we might find that certain technologies and certain methods of decarbonisation have prevailed and others have not. But at this point in time, you know, the scale of the challenge is so huge that we need to get all forms of technology and all kinds of initiatives up and running at scale uh, quickly 
um, so that we can start to tackle the problem. We should then let competition between technologies and between projects uh, run uh, so that we can eventually get the most economic solution going forward. And as, as the CCC uh, uh, have said, you know, why are we having the debate between in the domestic heating, for example, field, why are we having a debate between hydrogen and heat pumps? We need to develop both now and allow them to develop and pick and select the technologies that will prevail. For me, it's a similar story um, on, on low carbon hydrogen. We need to foster and develop CCUS at scale alongside the green hydrogen initiatives that we're already seeing. It's absolutely important to get things, get things going. Um, we, we are fully supporting the cluster approach, as I said, um, because that allows the collaboration that, that uh, Sir Ian and also Hube talked about. We have to have people working together with all their uh, various uh, expertise coming together to make us as effective and efficient as possible. Uh, one, one ask we have on the low carbon hydrogen standard that really is relevant for CCUS. This is being consulted uh, with government at the moment. We want to see that standard allowing and supporting all forms of hydrogen production, particularly those through CCUS, so blue hydrogen, whether it be from uh, steam methane reforming or autothermal reforming, that should be the standard that allows everybody to develop. Then we would happily see a certification scheme over and above that would, that would allow the relative uh, carbon intensities of all the different technologies to be rewarded, but we should be supporting all those various technologies and projects and initiatives right from the outset. And a final point on people, again, very much building on the, the comments that Syrian made, and we have a, a significant opportunity here to make the very best use of our existing sites, our existing people, our existing skills. You know, the, the clusters that Uniper is involved in, the, the, our Killingham site in the Humber region, looking to develop uh, 700 megawatts of blue hydrogen. Our Connors Key site in North Wales with access to Scottish wind via interconnectors, Welsh renewables. Uh, the Merseyside industrial area, and as well as you know, offshore storage on the, in Liverpool Bay and our, our, our partnership in, in Project Cavendish around the Isle of Grain, which if, if you'll have seen this morning announced, uh, Project Cavendish announced its connection with the ACORN project to ship and store CO2 uh, via, via Peterhead uh, port. All of these are really about building on the existing infrastructure and people and skills and collaborating on those sites in the most cost-effective way to utilize our existing sites, assets and people to put together the most compelling and the most cost-effective options so that we, as a UK business can develop a significant job uh, job market in the UK, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. But then we can take that further to be a global leader in these technologies so that we can export both the technology and export the intellectual property and the consulting around the world. And um, with that, Emma, I'll uh, close and hand back to you. Mike, and hoping very much to pick up on the skills and people point in the chat and, and on, which, on which note, we've already had um, questions coming through from the audience, but you don't have to wait until we start the panel discussion if questions occur to you while any of our speakers are speaking, you can put them into the chat and they're being picked up and sent over to me in live time. Um, uh, Mike talked about the, the clusters approach, Sylvian, and the kind of need for industrial sites and, and clusters to be a place where we get unlock opportunities, which is a good segue into your own response. And just to introduce um, Sylvian to those of you watching who don't know him, um, Sylvian Boltek is the principal consultant for CCUS and the industrial decarbonisation team leader for Element Energy which is an ERM group company. Okay. Sylvian, over to you. Thank you, Emma. Good morning, everyone. As Emma was saying, uh, my name is Sylvian Baltak and I lead the industrial carbonation and CCS team at Element Energy, and I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, we are a low carbon consultancy focused on energy transition, part of the ERM group, and we have over 20 years of experience in the, in the hydrogen and CCS space. Perhaps if we, if we move to the next slides, today um, I'll be talking a little bit about our work that we've been doing uh, for the Committee on Climate Change, industrial clusters, but also private clients on strategies and policies that enable uh, decarbonization of heavy industry focusing on CCS and hydrogen, but other technologies. And uh, what I'll be uh, enforcing here is about, uh, about the need for, um, for a collaborative approach to industrial decarbonization. And uh, I'm not talking here about an industrial site itself, but at a macro level, talking about the interdependencies need. And there are a lot of in the interdependencies uh, that will require a collaborative approach from top down, from the policymakers, but also bottom up, from each player, emitter, and project. And let's look at a slide. And uh, here we see the industrial cluster 
And I'm picking Hamburg, the, the largest industrial cluster as, in the UK, as an example. And there are over 20 large scale emitters in this cluster, as you can see on the map. And uh, all of them have their own needs. While some of those needs are somewhat specific to each sector and uh, site and uh, uh, type of uh, industry or power generator, they all have to rely on similar technologies because we're at a CCS conference today. All of those emitters will rely to some extent to carbon capture to capture emissions from uh, power, industry, and negative emissions. But they also need other technologies such as blue hydrogen, electrification, biomass, as well as an integrated uh, approach to efficient resource usage. And all of those will have to be connected together by infrastructure, such as CO2 and hydrogen pipelines and electricity wires. Doing everything alone as an industrial site, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it's very difficult to do everything in isolation. So it's a lot easier to, to work together and for example, share infrastructure. And while this sounds very easy, it actually requires a lot of coordination and a clear regional strategy, considering timing, scale, technical specification, and so on. Uh, the problem is also more complex when you, when you consider uh, different, different aspects. And maybe if we move to the next slide, uh, here we can see the interconnection between different players. So obviously we have the, the projects that are emerging. This is blue hydrogen production. We have CCS projects that are emerging around the clusters. We have projects delivering negative emissions. At the same time, there has to be some coordination between the projects and the markets uh, that will be benefiting from those projects. And those could be hydrogen users. Those could be industrial uh, sites deploying carbon capture or uh, companies buying carbon offsets. And Managing the supply and demand is actually not good enough. You actually need a third element to this, some external factors, which is the policy, the business models, uh, regulation and standards that would be actually be needed to be able to, to develop uh, those projects and get CCS clusters off the ground. And for all, for all of this, you actually need a collaborative approach. And the UK has tried previously to, to develop CCS before, actually twice. And both those attempts failed because, uh, because of a number of factors. One of them was, too much focus on one sector, i.e. power, but also a lot of uh, lack of collaboration between those three stakeholders, leading to increased costs and lack of supporting measures. And again, it sounds easy, uh, and you'd say that all you need to do is to get those stakeholders from those three groups into a room, and there you have a cluster, and then in that way you have four clusters by 2030. However, if we move to the next slide, the reality is that is actually more complex than that. So as you can see on this slide, the reality is that a lot of the UK industrial emissions lie outside industrial clusters, either as isolated industrial sites on the shoreline or inland. And it is critical for those sites to decarbonize and CO2 shipping and other ways of non-pipe transport may be needed to protect the jobs within those industrial sites, but also to, to enable the carbonization of, uh, of players within South Wales, Southampton, Dial of Grain, we, we mentioned uh, Project Cavendish earlier, and or the Peak District. And someone earlier mentioned that uh, the seabed is, uh, is getting a lot more crowded. And I would argue that the sea will also get quite crowded as a whole. And as we can see on, on this map, CO2 shipping could play a significant role in, uh, in enabling uh, industrial decarbonization. And CO2 shipping, if we consider it for a second, will require a lot of collaboration uh, from building the infrastructure, from the ships themselves, to ensuring a common set of CO2 specifications in terms of temperature and pressure, and this is not only about the project design or the capex aspects of the project, but it's also about the operations. How do you utilize the ships in the best way um, from planning the routes to achieve the lowest cost while carrying the highest volumes of CO2? And you can see on the map, an emitter could have multiple ways in which they emit the CO2. They can go A to B from the emitting side to a ship to the story side, or they can collaborate with other emitters and potentially stop on the way, collect more CO2, and then go to the story site, reaching economies of scale and delivering uh, greater uh, carbon savings. And then again, there are a few other aspects uh, that will require collaboration. Um, of course, uh, um, CCS is great because it could also enable negative emissions um, from power backs and the energy from waste and biohydrogen. And we have seen that we need lots of those negative emissions. And uh, for example, the Committee on Climate Change was mentioning in the CIS carbon budget that potentially over 100 megatons per year of negative emissions may be needed by 2050 to get to net zero. And the degree of support needed for such projects actually stretches outside of the classic industrial cluster setting and actually enters the corporate space. Many corporations such as Microsoft already have net zero targets and are looking to purchase those negative emission credits from a voluntary market. 
However, at the moment, the market is not fully regulated. So there's a lot more collaboration there needed between the corporations looking to buy the credits, between the negative emission producers who may actually need to, to um, uh, verify uh, the emissions themselves and also the, the policies to, to make sure that the market exists and uh, there are measures that incentivize people to, to use negative emissions when needed only. Perhaps before I stop, I would say that, you know, this is just top of iceberg and it is clear that a collaborative approach will be needed to, to get to, to net zero. And I still haven't spoken about international opportunities uh, where CO2 could be imported to the UK as, as the ACON project is looking to do. Hydrogen could be exported and there's a lot of potential for that, both bringing in hydrogen and skills that are developed in the UK in the context of industrial clusters are then exported to other countries looking to deploy uh, similar technologies. And of course, there are carbon credits that could be produced in the UK and then traded internationally. So to be able to enable all those opportunities that, that UK has and uh, they will be available in the coming years, uh, really collaborative action will be needed immediately. And while the road ahead may be bumpy and seem long, it is encouraging to see so many players being present at the conference today. And I have hope that working together with, with each other will be able to achieve net zero by 2050. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, Sylvian. Right, I'm going to just have a look at the time. Uh, unbelievably, we are five minutes ahead of schedule, which is the first time that has ever happened to me in a, in a chairing place. And we've already got questions coming through. Um, but to kick off, um, why don't we pick up on um, Hube's uh, kind of pertinent question from the beginning, which is, you know, we've all been discussing carbon capture um, and storage technologies for, at least the decade that I've been in the energy industry and, and for some of our speakers longer than that. So if we have been discussing the technology for a long time, if we in, in fact are using it, as Florian said in the North Sea, why haven't we translated that technology to some things you know, at scale yet? Um, and what would we need to do that, I suppose, is the second question. So um, who would like to have a have a go at answering Hube's, you know, um, challenge to the panel? Um, and we're all muted, don't forget. So if you want to come in, mute. And for my panelists, if you put your hands up like this, I can see you and bring you in. Mike. Thanks, Emma. I think the um, one of the key things we need to see is this is it is such a significant investment that no individual company or not even, collect, not even a collection of companies will be able to make those decisions alone. If you look at what it's taken via the cluster approach, you know, as Sir Ian said, we will need billions of investment in a particular region to establish a transportation and storage infrastructure, and then significant investment with the various sites, uh, industry sites, emitters and, and, and uh, producers currently of um, of, of carbon-based fuels to convert, um, that it takes then a, a concerted effort backed by government at a significant scale. And I, I genuinely don't think we've seen that before, not in the UK market. What we're talking about here, you know, just for example, in the Zero Carbon Humber project we're involved in is 12 major organisations working alongside government to have a significant multi-billion investment. And it's essentially the diagram that you saw there from Sylvan with all of those potential emitters in, in, in one area. We simply haven't seen that, that scale before taken seriously and properly backed um, uh, with business models and frameworks. And perhaps you know, linking that to the question that was also asked to me in the, in the chat, you know, what, what will it take to get it going then? Well, actually it's, it's three things. It's getting that transport and storage in place, which is essentially for that region will be essentially a monopoly business that will need to be uh, then providing a service to all the other emitters. So having the regulatory framework in place to enable an organization to operate that effectively and with a reasonable rate of return, and then allowing the individual emitters to have their own business models to enable them to make their investments. And that is key. So we are waiting early 2022 when those business models um, should be finalized, because as, you know, it's clear, you know, utilize or producing hydrogen, blue hydrogen will be more expensive than natural gas. So we have to have a business model that covers the delta between the two, that incentivizes both producers to produce low carbon hydrogen 
and consumers to consume it. Also, we'll have to have in the industrial areas you know, incentives to make sure that um, investment is made by industry emitters so that they are willing to go to, to invest in the cost of doing that and not disadvantage themselves in, in, a, in a global competitive environment. So we need the, we need these things to come forward. We need the details behind it. It's being consulted on now, but when those details are finalised, all the various uh, investors and companies can make their final investment decisions. Matt, I'll, I'll see if um, anyone else wants to come on this point, but certainly from my point of view, I'd observe two things about where we're at. Firstly, I do think we're at a point in decarbonisation and, and energy economics, actually, where the transition is speeding up. And I think companies are, you know, the, the, there is therefore more capital and more incentive in the broadest possible sense to, to get um, carbon capture and utilisation of storage away. Um, and then I think the other thing though that you're talking to Mike is an appreciation of the complexity of it in that, you know, whenever we tend to talk about either production or offtake and the challenge for the government is making sure that they've got a much more integrated and systemic approach. And that's quite a different way of thinking to the way they currently think about energy policy. So yeah, as you say, interested to see where we get to in 2022. Does anyone else have views on this? Okay. So Mike and I on our two pens, why has why it taken so long and what do we need to do to get it going? Ian? Yeah, just very briefly, <coughs> what we've got to remember, this is really all comparatively new for the UK. Um, I mean, oil and gas has largely dominated our um, energy position for a long period of time. Um, and we're now just getting started. I mean, that's why government, I mean, we're going to have to catch up. Government are going to have to play a role in helping catch up. Um, and, and, you know, I made the point earlier, um, I don't understand why at this stage in the game now, we're only talking about moving ahead with two um, major carbon capture projects. That's, that's not good enough. If we're going to catch up, we should be talking of at least double that. Um, I, I, I think in terms of the license rounds, I mean, I think, I think the Scotland uh, license round, well, we know it's been very well received. There's going to be 15 licenses um, issued there in February next year. Um, I mean, I, I think I think we're now on an accelerated catch up. Um, so I mean, that's the good news. But we've been slow to start. Frankly, in terms of our supply chain and supporting all of this, you know, the, the work in the last couple of years has been coming from Denmark and Holland and others to, to do the, the supply chain work. So we've got a catching up job to do there. But but we are moving now. And collab I mean, collaboration. I think one of the biggest challenges, everyone's talking about collaboration, one of the biggest challenges is actually getting big companies to collaborate because um, they're not good at it. They just generally don't do it. And in oil and gas, um, we, we had a huge issue where over many years, some very, very, very large companies um, were just head on competition. But, but actually, when it got to the stage where things got rough and difficult, um, and we, we did a review in 2012 and came up with the, um, you know, some pretty positive issues about how do you get collaboration. We were eventually getting and are now getting much better collaboration within oil and gas. And if we can do that, then we should be able to do it in the other, with the other big players as well in, in the new energies. A really good point on collaboration. There's actually a question in from the audience. I'm, I'm, um... I'm not sure we'll be able to answer it, but let's give it a go. It says they like very much the emphasis that all the panelists have, have put on collaboration in this session. Um, and they want to know whether we go one step further in our definition of you know, what a collaborative model looks like and think about things like circular economy principles in clusters such as the Humber. Um, and, and so I think what they're asking there is, is there a kind of broader sense of how we can bring different industries together beyond the carbonisation, but thinking about how that whole system will work in a kind of closed loop fashion. Would anyone like to take that? I mean, perhaps Sylvian, because yeah. you unfortunately were the person to talk about clusters. No, no, that, that, that's fine. That's a very interesting point. And I do agree that circular economy will play a significant role moving forward. At the moment, a lot of the focus is on decarbonisation. So how do you capture the emissions? How do you fuel switch? But uh, obviously, this solves some of the scope one and scope two emissions. I think 
when it comes to, to the scope two, three emissions, uh, a more deeper view has to be taken on that. Circular economic principles will certainly play a role there. There will be, I guess, a push from the, some of the customers to see products that are based on uh, recycled materials. But there will also be an incentive for some, some producers to actually uh, recycle uh, goods and materials and develop new products out of those um, because there, there will be a reduction in cost. So for example, that could be the case for steel, that could be the case for cement, but also overall, I think there's a lot more scope in other industries as well. And it has not been explored that much at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of push, I would say, especially in the Humber from the, some of the academic groups, for example, at the University of Hull, there is a um, project called Incubus, I think, uh, that is looking at the uh, industrial symbiosis within the Humber, and they are doing some ugly work on that. But, but I do agree that more work has to be done to understand how different industrial sites could collaborate around the supply chain and around the circular economy and how they can in, be integrated uh, within the classic, but also within the, the wider UK, UK picture. Yes, but I'm just, you know, a, a bit like I suspect many of the people watching this and in this conversation just hot, hot off the heels of the political party conferences. And I was struck that a lot of the, the conversation around heat decarbonisation and heat networks was also coming from MPs where they have industrial clusters where they can see the potential for hydrogen. And whilst we're clear that a lot of heat decarbonisation will be done from electrification, you can see the attraction of having these kind of ecosystems for energy, which are much more regionally focused, where we're able to use, you know, hydrogen and heavy industry to then provide services to local people as well, including possibly for heat. So fascinating question there. Um, I've had a couple of questions in from the audience about the, the business model and the risk case and, and costs and how we unlock investment and they're sort of related. So we'll, um, I, I suppose, just ask the panel to unpick a little bit what you think, you know, regulators and policymakers need to do exactly in order to unlock the kind of capital investment we're talking about. You know, what is the sort of framework that you think would look? Because they're noting it's a very, very different way of thinking to perhaps um we're used to in the energy sector so does anyone want to take that what is the what you know what do you what do you need to do risk for investment mike thanks emma yeah and building on the the comments i was making before i think that the business models are are being consulted on um we are we're very much in favor of something akin to what has been successful in offshore wind um a, a cfd or a contract for difference where there's some kind of reference price, and you can debate what that should be. But some kind of reference price that uh, is reflects the current cost of, of providing a service, uh, and then uh, a delta is paid via the mechanism uh, and is backed by government, which gives you some certainty, which de-risks the project. And, and then the duration, may be a, a number of years again in consultation and can be debated, but given the significant capital sums involved in this, would need to be of the duration of 10 to 15 years, certainly from my perspective. And that then allows various projects to compete for those, uh, for those projects. And, and that's, the, that's the element I was talking about before, uh, allows an element of innovation because you want to be competitive, you want to bring new technologies, you want to bring different ideas and initiatives. Um, and, and it allows you then via the, the scale at which essentially government chooses to purchase by those, those CFDs purchase the services or the volume uh, of, of low carbon or CCUS based um, power or, or hydrogen in, this, in, in these examples that I'm referring to, you can then steer the scale and you can introduce a competitive element. Um, and that's, it's the details of those models that are, you know, are being fine tuned uh, over the next couple of months. And that's what will enable us to de-risk projects. And I think I, I agree and pick up on your point, Emma, as well, looking at you know, the recent party conference season, um, you know, the, the support for the amount of airtime given to green investment, the amount of attention for all politicians of all colours and backgrounds um, about making sure that we tackle this. And this is an absolute imperative. Um, this is what also gives me the confidence that why it's different to previous previous iterations of CCUS, previous iterations of, of, of decarbonisation. There's a massive momentum behind it and a very pragmatic momentum that if we get the business models right, give investors confidence that we can put the right kind of risk or de-risking to allow private investors to come in at scale with significant sums. That's, um, I think that's absolutely right. I came back 
surprisingly uplifted by the amount of discussion there was on, on net zero at um, political party conference. And let me tell you, for those in the audience not familiar with political party conferences, that has not always been the case. So there has been a real um, sea change there. Um, this is a complete self-indulgence from me, but I basically want to hear Hugh talk about um, offshore islands and hydrogen grids and whether or not that's possible in, in the UK context and um, including things like interconnectors. So Hugh, would you take that question, please? Oh, yes, absolutely. And um, it, it, it is, it is it, offshore islands are a really um, interesting concept because um, what they will do is they will allow us to coordinate a number of different services in one geographic location. Now, offshore islands, I don't believe we should conceive of them in the Mediterranean context, even though those visualizations are the ones I like best. But maybe we should think of them as industrial clusters offshore. And in a sense, uh, yeah, I, I used to work in oil and gas in a, you know, a, 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 a long while ago. And when you think of um, you know, the old Brent fields, they are, uh, in a sense, offshore islands, which have a whole host of very complex technology, uh, uh, machinery, people, plant, all in one location. So uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. We've had offshore islands uh, ever since BP um, has started the 40s field. So can we do it for, in a sense, different technologies? So the ones where you take, uh, for example, electricity from floating wind farms, you convert that into molecules, whether it's ammonia, whether it's hydrogen, um, for use by industries either on land or industries themselves residing in an, in an offshore location? Um, the answer is yes. And the two points I will uh, make uh, on that is that there is a lot of work happening in government and with the market at the moment. So um, OTNR is a four letter acronym, uh, Offshore Transmission Network Review. It is a consultation that is currently running from, uh, from the government, from the Department for Business. And it is looking at the enduring regime for offshore connection of offshore wind farms. And it is looking at these big strategic questions. The second one is that, uh, to your question, Emma, uh, molecules and power start to look pretty similar. Um, electricity networks, gas networks, hydrogen networks, surely we have to think of them as being one and the same, which is, they are highways to provide energy and raw materials to society. So a um, more uniform regulatory approach is also very much on the cards. And um, as Crown Estate, uh, this all links with the area of uh, spatial planning, strategic spatial planning, and we are working intensely with, with a whole range of private sector stakeholders, environmental stakeholders, the fishing sector government to also uh, interpret what it means for ensuring the continued access uh, to the seabed from the private sector, because we need private capital to help us tackle those twin challenges of uh, climate and ec uh, ecological crises. Thank you. That answer was mostly for me, but I hope everyone in the audience also enjoyed it. I am I'm fascinated to see if we can we can you know really develop that space and and and, and I'd add here to your list of complications, of course, that that probably means interactions with other jurisdictions if we're talking about an island in the North Sea and then import and export across markets. And so it's a incredibly complex but exciting challenge from. Government. Speaking of complex and exciting challenges, um, a question for everyone on the panel, and I suppose it depends on your particular view of CCS technology, but someone's asked about what is the actual status of the of, of um, CCS as a kind of technology today, and what is the infrastructure improvement we need to be making, you know, per or post oxyfuel combustion installments question, or any other thing, to, to speed up the installation of it and for it to do what we need it to do now in the energy system. So how's the actual technology, not just the market? Who wants to take that? I'll Do have a go and maybe someone else will also jump in. I, I think 
maybe it's worth kind of looking back and thinking that uh, CCS has been around for a number of years. You know, there have been CCS pipelines used for enhanced oil recovery in, in, in uh, North America, in uh, Texas, for example, and Louisiana since the 1970s. So it's been a technology that has been demonstrated at scale uh, when it comes to the infrastructure. Uh, when it comes to the carbon capture technology, obviously there are different flavors around it. You can have uh, pre-combustion, post-combustion, there are different technologies around it. Uh, there's the first generation of amine absorbers that are having demonstrated before, are used in some of the um, existing CCS projects, and there are established technologies. Obviously, there's always um, room to do be better, and there are cost reductions that could be achieved if you go to the next generation. Uh, however, the, the, the issue with newer technologies, obviously, they haven't been uh, show, demonstrated at scale or uh, at pilot uh, stage enough, so the TRL is relatively lower. So there's more work to be done there. But at the same time, there's so much activity in this space and so much R&D going in, into this uh, area that there are many technology developers developing new uh, technologies that, uh, that will enable CCS to deploy at scale. And you know, we can just list a few now. You know, there's Carbon Clean, there's your solutions, there's Acre, Acre Carbon Capture and so on, all of them having innovative ideas and technologies that could be put at use. And uh, uh, there's a lot of activity. And, um, with, with the right funding and investment and demonstration projects around the clusters, there's certainly um, certainty there that uh, uh, CCS would be would be deployed at scale. So the technology is not an issue from my point of view. I think it's more about the policy, the economics, the, the regulations, business models around it, and the collaborative approach. Because to be able to have a CCS project, you need the full chain to be integrated from the carbon capture site or sites, ideally, to have um, large volumes and, and economies of scale, all the way to the pipeline and the story cycle of, offshore. So you have to really align the, those players and the timings and scales and specifications and all of that. Right, so it's not a technology problem, it's a, a markets problem. Um, there's, there's one more question that I should ask because it gets asked for every panel. I'm sure it will get asked all day today. And, and then um, and I think we've just got time to put it in, which is there's interest from the audience about the blue green hydrogen transition and a, a couple of our speakers touched upon it and the the question is how do you make sure you do that transition so if if we're confident that in the long run it'll be green hydrogen for net zero and or because we're making it from the offshore wind fleet but we develop the business models and the infrastructure using blue are you worried about stranded assets or, or are you worried about how you get investment into green whilst also doing blue? What does that kind of economic model look like? Is there a tension there? Are you worried about it, et cetera? Um, and I can see Sylvia nodding. So maybe we'll just start with him again and then I'll come to the rest of the panel. Okay, without monopolizing too much of the discussion, I'll let Mike speak about this if I can. I think he raised his hand. I think to get uh, the UK to net zero, you need both blue and green hydrogen and you need action immediately in both sectors. Obviously one technology could be scaled up uh, quicker than other, uh, but at the same time, uh, both of them will be using common infrastructure. So pipelines around the clusters or the, the gas network that can be converted to hydrogen could take both blue, green, pink, purple, you know, there are many colors, colors of hydrogen that, that people define. So that, that's not a risk there, I think. Um, what is important for the policymakers to realize is that uh, the business model may be different depending on when when you initiate a project. A project initiated, you know, in the next couple of years, which might be on blue hydrogen, may have different economics compared to a project uh, initiated in the next fifteen years, uh, which may be more green hydrogen. So I think that has to be that has to be included in the in the policymakers' decisions, without discriminating. You know, in, in, in 15 years time from now, of course, that was initiated early and managed to scale up hydrogen um, because in 15 years time, it may be actually more expensive compared to a new green hydrogen project that may appear then. So I think that has to be recognized by the business model and policymakers. Mike? Uh, the two-pot system was the way we were going. Mike? Yeah, fully support, fully support what Sylvan just said. We, we need blue in order to scale up and get going and get moving. Um, and if that then stimulates a hydrogen economy that then shifts to green over time, then, then so be it. This is the point I was making about we need to just get going and, and allow competition between technologies uh, to develop. The business models um, have to protect against that stranded asset issue, and that's a key part of them so that we can have the confidence to invest now. But, but as I said, if we look back in 2050 and find there was a transition and the initial assets that got us going and got us moving uh, were, were supported, 
that's what is that's what's necessary. Also, the issue of global uh, demand for this. If we develop a UK business um, and prove the technology and develop that, there will be other markets around the world that can benefit from from our technology, and we can export that uh, as we go through the decade with our experience. So I. I, I don't see a risk uh, uh, in terms of uh, the transition. Actually, it's a, a necessary uh, transition that we can manage and use to our advantage. Thank you. I'm afraid that we are out of time. Now, I think we could keep doing this all morning. Um, so, you know, forced to be to thank the panel again for their contributions and to Sarian for his really illuminating keynote at that change from, you know, North Sea oil and gas to, you know, what will be a a very different energy industry at the end of the, the next couple of decades. Um, I have to um, signpost apparently the audience for next sessions, which start at midday um, and sponsored by Shell looks at um, carbon capture utilization of storage from a customer's perspective, the speakers from Microsoft, Industry Wales and Viridor. And then there's more after lunch with delivering net zero for all and looking at what can be done to bring the public with us on this journey. And for my part, I've learned a lot from this. And I'm, I think the two really big themes that come out of this, are, you know, collaboration and, and therefore a need to do policy and regulation very differently to get carbon capture away, which you all agree is essential. The only thing I'm very sorry we didn't have more time to discuss is that collaboration with skills and how we move some of the talented engineers and others that Ian has worked with across his career into the new technologies and clusters that we're talking about for the future. But perhaps you'll pick that up throughout the day. Otherwise, thank you very much all for joining us and good luck with the rest of the conference. <laughs>